It's stressful when you can't pay your bills. You may question your self-worth and feel humiliated and angry when creditors call. Job or family problems are likely, both as a cause and as an effect of your debt problems. As a result, you may be extra sensitive to insulting or coercive tactics by bill collectors. Lies, mistakes, and harassment you might ordinarily shrug off are magnified. You're more likely than normal to lash out or act rashly. Knowing your rights under the Federal Fair Debt Collection Practices Act may help you act calmly and wisely to protect yourself and get your affairs in order. The law was enacted to combat abusive and dishonest tactics by bill collectors. Here are the basics. Number one, the law applies only to bill collectors, not to creditors. Creditors typically pass their seriously overdue bills to debt collectors who receive a portion of whatever they collect. This portion is usually between 10 and 25 percent. The law also applies to lawyers acting to collect debts for clients. Number two, debt collectors must identify themselves when they call and tell you who they're working for. Furthermore, unless you agree, they may not call before 8 in the morning or after 9 in the evening. They may not call repeatedly to annoy you or threaten you with harm, damage your property, or your reputation. Number three, collectors may not make false statements such as using a false name, implying you have committed a crime, threatening arrest or imprisonment, falsely implying they represent a government, falsely claiming to be an attorney, or falsely claiming to work for a credit bureau. They also may not send papers that look like court or government documents but aren't, or threaten to sue, garnish wages, or attach your property. Also, collectors can't take you to court. Only the creditor can sue you, and a court order is required in some states for garnishment and attachments. When there is a garnishment, the court orders your employer to pay a portion of your salary directly to the creditor. Number four, a collector also may not collect any amount greater than your debt. Nor can they publish your inability to pay, deposit a post-dated check early, or give out false credit information about you. Number five, you have the right to privacy. A collector may discuss your debt only with you, your spouse, your attorney, and your parent if you're a minor. While a collector may contact anyone to locate you or to verify your address, they may not tell anyone that you owe money or identify themselves as a bill collector unless asked. They may not use postcards to contact you or put anything on the envelope that identifies them as bill collectors. Number six, you're entitled to written notice of how much you owe and to whom. You have 30 days to dispute a bill. If you do, all collection activity must stop until you get proof of the validity of the debt. Number seven, if you owe several debts, any payment you make must be applied to those debts as you direct. Collectors cannot apply your payment to any debt that you don't authorize. If they're getting 20% from one creditor and 10% from another, they may not arbitrarily apply a larger portion of your payment to the debt which pays them a higher percentage. Number eight, you may stop a bill collector from contacting you in two ways, retain an attorney or send a written notice. If you retain an attorney, the collector must then contact only your attorney. Your second option is to send a written notice to the collector saying you'll deal directly with your creditor. You should then contact the creditor. However, refusing to deal with a collector doesn't cancel your debt. The law recognizes that debtors are usually not in a good position to pay lawyers to enforce their rights, so it provides incentives to successful debtors and their lawyers. Debtors are permitted to sue in federal court over violations of the federal law. If they're successful, they are awarded actual damages, which are usually small, along with attorney's fees and statutory damages of up to $1,000. The availability of attorney's fees means that if you have a good case against a collection agency, you should be able to find and afford a lawyer who will pursue it. As I've mentioned, if you default on a secured loan, your creditor normally gets the right to repossess the property that serves as the security. 
If it's real estate, the repossession process is called foreclosure, and the lender must carefully follow certain steps required by law. Foreclosure can take a long time, and in most states gives you several opportunities to cure the default and keep the property. With appliances, furniture, and other household items, creditors must usually go to court to repossess their collateral because they can't enter your home without your permission. My brother got a couple payments behind on his car. He came out of work one day and the car was gone. It had been repossessed. He didn't have any warning. Is this legal? Most likely, yes. In a few states, the repo man can repossess your car from your unlocked garage or from the parking lot at your work when the lender hasn't even notified you that you're in default. And it doesn't matter whether or not the lender is right. The only restriction is that the repossessor not breach the peace. This means that the repossessor must avoid the possibility of physical confrontation with you. As a result, cars are often repossessed while you're not physically near them. There are a few states where the law prohibits a repossessor from taking a locked car off the street. Most states are somewhat in between. But the trend is toward limiting repossession rights because in practice, automobile repossessions often do lead to violence, which definitely does disturb the peace. My car was repossessed after I couldn't make the final $1,000 payment on it. Now I have the extra money to make that payment. What are my rights? Depending upon your particular state, you may have the right to cure the default and get your car back. Normally, you must pay the creditor for all the outstanding loan charges, including penalties and interest, as well as the cost for any attorney's fees and other expenses incurred while having the car repossessed. You should notify the creditor as soon as possible if you intend to pay off the balance on a defaulted loan. If you do fall behind on a secured loan or any debt, the best advice is always to notify your creditor immediately. If you can't work something out, it's probably better to give up the property you cannot afford. If you're not sure of your rights and options, be sure to get legal advice. Bankruptcy is a drastic remedy for drastic situations. According to the Supreme Court, it's meant to provide a new opportunity in life, unhampered by the pressure and discouragement of pre-existing debt. That definition is all well and good, but bankruptcy carries a stigma of failure, and it's both costly and complex. Most experts feel that many of the half million Americans who file for bankruptcy each year don't have to do so. They can work out a wage earner plan or other arrangement with their creditors. In any case, it's an area where expert personal advice is essential. Here are some bankruptcy basics. The most common type of bankruptcy is called Chapter 7, Straight Bankruptcy. Liquidating straight, or Chapter 7 bankruptcy, is the only real bankruptcy. In theory, it's simple. You turn over your property to a trustee who's been appointed by the court. The trustee sells it, distributes the proceeds to your creditors, and cancels your debts. You start over without debts or assets. In practice, however, it's really much more complicated. Each state has its own list of exempt property, which means property that you get to keep. In Pennsylvania, for example, you may keep Bibles, a sewing machine, clothes, some insurance, and pension benefits, and $300 of other property. In Oregon, you may keep $15,000 of real estate, a car worth up to $1,200, tools worth up to $750, as well as one rifle or shotgun and a pistol. In Texas and Florida, your home may be entirely exempt. And in most cases, a married couple filing for a joint bankruptcy may be entitled to double the amount of their exemptions. Some creditors get preference over others. Secured creditors are those to whom you've pledged property as collateral. They're usually entitled to their security, such as the house for the mortgage, or the car for the auto loan. This means that general or unsecured creditors without any security interest usually get very little. Statistics show 
that only 13% of straight bankruptcy cases result in any payment at all to general creditors. Even when they do receive some payment, the average is only five to eight cents for every dollar of their claims. Some debts aren't dischargeable through bankruptcy, such as taxes, alimony, child support, educational loans, and the cost of the bankruptcy itself. That means even if you declare bankruptcy, you still owe those debts. Because of its devastating effects, you can declare bankruptcy only once in six years. Another form of bankruptcy is the Chapter 13 Wage Earner Plan. A wage earner plan looks to your future income to pay off debt rather than to existing assets. A Chapter 13 plan is actually debt restructuring, not bankruptcy, but it's supervised by the bankruptcy court. Its counterpart for businesses is a Chapter 11 reorganization. In Chapter 13, you and your attorney devise a plan for repaying most or all of your debts over an extended period of time, usually three years. A trustee controls the part of your income that's needed to pay the debts. In Chapter 13, you normally get to keep all of your assets. A wage earner plan is usually preferable to a Chapter 7 bankruptcy, but it's only possible if you have a steady source of income and it does take more time than straight bankruptcy. The only debts not dischargeable through Chapter 13 are taxes, alimony, and child support. There are other alternatives if you fall behind in debt payment. Most people who consider bankruptcy have been in financial difficulty for quite a while, but it's worth emphasizing that it is usually helpful to contact your creditors as soon as you realize you're falling behind. If you take the initiative, Creditors are more apt to be flexible about extending your payment schedule. Financial counseling is available through many state and local governments. There are even formal creditor groups that help people work out a payment plan. These groups realize that creditors usually do better by keeping people out of the bankruptcy court. But be aware that while the creditor would prefer you not to declare bankruptcy, it may be better for you if you do. That is why, if you're considering bankruptcy, you should seek advice immediately from a lawyer who specializes in it. Filing in bankruptcy court is both a serious step and a powerful weapon. Timing can be critical. Filing for bankruptcy temporarily stops all creditor action against you, including lawsuits already filed and collection of judgments already issued, not to mention phone calls, wage garnishments, and threatening letters. But filing also ends your control over your property. And payments you've made on your debts within 90 days of filing will be collected back as part of the pool of assets controlled by the trustee. So will any payments or transfers of property to family members or close business associates made during the entire year before you file. Concealing such a payment is considered fraud and could mean you won't get a discharge of your debts at all. Your future financial prospects are important in timing bankruptcy. Normally, you shouldn't file until you're pretty sure that you've hit bottom financially. If you're going to continue to pile up debt because of inadequate income, even after your existing debt is discharged, then bankruptcy usually should wait. It won't solve the problem, and you can't file for bankruptcy again for six years. Serious financial problems seldom occur in isolation. They usually cause and are caused by other difficulties. These can be medical, behavioral, and economic. Bankruptcy will strain even the most harmonious family. So will the unemployment that often leads to bankruptcy. My husband and I had to declare bankruptcy last year. Now we're both working and have turned our lives around. How do we go about reestablishing credit? Reestablishing credit after bankruptcy isn't usually as difficult as many people believe. While the fact of your bankruptcy can remain on your credit record for 10 years, many merchants will extend credit anyway if you have a steady income. Some are even eager to do so because they know that you're prohibited from going bankrupt again right away. Be upfront with the creditors you want to have a relationship with, and they may work with you despite your past history. I'm doing fine, but one of the businesses I deal with isn't. They cash my check but haven't delivered the merchandise. What can I do? Consumers tend to get the short end of business bankruptcies 
because most of the debts businesses have with consumers are unsecured. The debts usually involve merchandise or services you've paid for but haven't received. If a business files for a Chapter 7 liquidation, your chances of getting anything are remote. There's not likely to be anything left after the secured creditors exercise their rights. But if a company files for a reorganization under Chapter 11, your prospects are much better. You'll need to file some forms and wait a long time, but if you persevere, you should get something. If you find out that a company that owes you money or merchandise has filed for bankruptcy, call the bankruptcy court for information on steps that you will need to take to protect your claim. There is a saying that the only things we can count on are death and taxes. Even though most of us pay taxes every year, there are some questions that are often asked. There's no way I can pay my taxes by April 15th. What'll happen to me if I file late? If you don't file your taxes by April 15th, you may be subject to a penalty for late filing, interest, and other late payment charges. In an effort to avoid late payment penalties, you may want to get the automatic four-month extension form. You can get the form from the post office, bank, library, or nearest IRS office. Fill it out and close a check for the amount of taxes you estimate that you will owe and mail it by April 15th. This can save you the penalty for late filing if the amount you pay with the extension form is equal to or exceeds the tax that you actually owe. What should I do if I owe the government more than I'm able to pay on April 15th? If you don't pay the IRS the amount due on April 15th, you'll probably have to pay various interest and penalties later on. Therefore, you may be better off borrowing the money to make the payment on time. You should determine whether the late payment charges you'll have to pay the IRS are greater than the interest you'd have to pay on a loan from the bank. In most cases, the IRS charges would be greater so you're better off borrowing to pay off your taxes on time. If I get someone to fill out my income tax form for me and that person makes an error, can I be held responsible? Yes, you can. No matter who fills out your tax form, you are held responsible for paying the correct tax and you will be held liable for interest and penalties if less than the correct amount is paid. Keep in mind that if an accountant fills out your form and makes a mistake, you may be able to sue to recover damages. If the person who filled out your form wasn't a professional, it would be more difficult for you to win the case since this person wouldn't be held to the same high standard as an accountant. Every taxpayer has the chance of being audited. Business owners, wealthy individuals, and those with unusual returns stand higher risks of a tax audit. But as the IRS improves its ability to match bank and investment records with individual returns, more and more average taxpayers are likely to be asked for additional information. How does the IRS decide which individuals will be audited? The IRS uses a computer program to detect errors or fraud in an individual return. The IRS doesn't release information on the exact criteria its computer uses in selecting a return for audit. IRS employees then review the returns picked by the computer and select the ones they feel should be audited. A small percentage of those income tax returns are then picked at random to be audited. As a taxpayer, you should also be aware of IRS tax audits. There are three types of audits I want to discuss. Correspondence audits, field audits, and office audits. Correspondence audits are the simplest. They usually involve one bit of unreported income or one deduction and can be handled entirely by mail. Simply mail copies of the information that supports your position. Correspondence audits are by far the most common, but most taxpayers don't consider them audits. Field audits take place at your place of business, your accountant's office, or more rarely, your home. Seek professional assistance if you're contacted for a field audit. Office audits involve meeting with a revenue agent at an IRS office about specific aspects of your return. I have six suggestions for handling an office audit. Number one, if you're audited, don't hesitate to seek professional help. Most correspondence audits and some office audits just involve clerical matters such as supplying receipts. 
Others involve complex legal issues or close judgment calls. You are entitled to be represented by an attorney, accountant, or enrolled agent at any stage of the audit process. Once you choose a representative, the IRS won't contact you directly, but will work through your representative. If you have any doubt about your ability to handle an audit, call an attorney or an accountant. Number two, know your appeal rights. If you can't reach agreement with a revenue agent, you're entitled to a hearing by the IRS Appeals Division. If their decision is unsatisfactory, you then have two choices. You can appeal to the tax court, or you can pay the tax and sue for a refund in the federal district court or the claims court. You should not file for any appeal without professional advice, but you should know that the revenue agent's opinion is not final. Number three, when you have to face the IRS, organize your presentation. Have copies available for the agent of all relevant records. Never give the IRS your originals. Have a printed copy of the calculations you're relying on to prove your case. Clearly present your reasoning, records, and calculations. If a figure is an estimate, show why it's only an estimate and why it is a reasonable one. Suggestion number four, don't volunteer any information. Take to the audit only those records related to the items specified in the audit letter. Your audit usually won't go beyond those items, even though the agent is permitted to expand the scope of the audit. He'll be less tempted to do so if it means you have to schedule another meeting. Do not offer explanations or records for other items, even if you can't see how they can hurt you. Suggestion number five when you're being audited is be reasonable, professional, and polite. You are unlikely to successfully bully or sweet-talk an agent. They've heard it all before, but they're human, so they'll find it easier to be reasonable if you are. If you think an agent is being unreasonable, you have a right to speak to his supervisor. That may be also advisable if you feel that the agent is wrongly interpreting the law. Suggestion number six for a tax audit is be open to compromise. IRS agents are under pressure to close cases and generate revenue. They don't want too many of their cases appealed and they don't want to lose the ones that are. That can give you leverage for an advantageous quick settlement or it can mean you'd be better off waiting. Don't be pressured into an on-the-spot settlement, but recognize that it might be your best bet. However, don't expect a full deduction if you don't have full documentation. On this cassette, you've received the basic information you should have about handling your money. Seek professional advice from a lawyer, accountant, or other qualified financial advisor whenever you have a question or are facing legal action.